All right, and we're going to go ahead and start so our presenter has enough time to give us all her amazing information. Hello, my name is Yolanda Prado. I am the Makerspace Coordinator here at the ELA Area Public Library. And we are so excited because we have been planning this for a while. This whole week, we are calling it Bee Week. We have a bunch of different bee programming going on. Welcome to Native Pollinators. And our presenter today is Nicole Flowers. And I just want to give a huge thank you to our Lake Zurich Rotary Club for helping us um, by sponsoring this whole um, week. So it's been incredible to partner with them. And then without further ado, I just want to introduce our speaker. Her name is um, Natalie Flowers Kimmerly, and she's a horticulture educator with the University of Illinois Extension, serving Fulton, Mason, Peoria, and Tazewell counties. Nicole has a BS in crop science with the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign and an MS in agronomy, specializing in wheat science from the University of Wisconsin in Madison. Nicole got her teaching certificate from Montana State University while working there as a research associate. She then came home to Illinois to teach high school chemistry. She now helps share research-based information about all kinds of horticulture topics. One of the highlights of her current job is working with Extension Master Gardeners and Extension Master Naturalists. So I just want to say thank you so much, Nicole, for being here with us today and presenting on this amazing topic. And I know I love bees and I can't wait to learn more from you. So I'm just going to turn off my camera and let you take it away. Okay. Hello, everyone. Just give me a second here. All right. So we are going to talk about bees a little bit, but we're also going to talk about some other pollinators. So I hope we'll get a whole overview on some of our native pollinators. I like Yolanda said, I am Nicole Flowers Kimberly. I live in Tazewell County with my husband and my kiddos. And um, if you know anything about this part of Illinois, we are in near the pumpkin capital of the world. And so we have some maybe some unique squash bees around here that uh, might be interesting. So. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. I hope you, I love this picture with our bee just covered in pollen. And so when we're talking about pollinators, I think that's a great picture for us to think about. I think I will. This though. Sorry, I can't. Okay. So just as we're thinking about pollinators, the first thing we kind of wonder is why should we care? Well, you probably noticed that pollinators have been in the news in the lot in the last few years, whether it is a colon, a colony collapse with the honeybees or monarch population declines or bumblebees being as listed as endangered species. We have one called the rusty patch bumblebee here in Illinois that has been officially put on the endangered species list. But why do we care? Well, here's why we care. Uh, many plants can't rep reproduce without the help of pollinators. 75% of all plant species are pollinated by some sort of animal, whether that be insects, birds, bats, etc. Over 90% of our flowering plant species need pollinators in order to reproduce. So if we didn't have any pollinators, there would be a lot less plant diversity. And the plants they pollinate provide food not only for humans, but also wildlife, such as migratory birds. And I know that there's a statistic that's out there that says one out of every three bites of our food depends on pollinator plant interactions. And so if you think about what our plates would look like without them, they'd be quite a bit different than we see today. Pollinators include bees, butterflies, moths, wasps, beetles, flies, birds, and bats. Here in this part of the world, birds and bats are not the most common pollinators. You might see some hummingbirds at your flowers, uh, but mostly our pollinators are insects. So we're gonna really focus on them today. Uh, one interesting thing is that bats are good poll are pollinators for cactuses in the desert. So if you do a pollinator event there in the desert, you might hear more about bats. All right, so what these are some fruits and vegetables that require pollination. So you can see this list here is pretty extensive. Over 150 food crops in the United States need pollinators in order to reproduce. And that's a lot of our fruit and vegetable crops like apples, peaches, pumpkins, sunflower, and raspberries. Even plants like carrots, we, we eat the root and we don't really necessarily think they need pollinators, 
but we need them to have their flowers pollinated so that we can get the seeds so we can make a new uh, bunch of carrot seed for the next year. If pollinators aren't present, we would not have any of these fruits and vegetables or we would have to pollinate them ourselves. There are some places in China where fruit trees have to be hand pollinated because pollinator uh, populations are extremely low. And so I've seen a picture of people standing in trees with paintbrushes doing hand pollination. And I will tell you, humans are not as efficient pollinators as these uh, insects. So we just don't do it. It takes us a lot longer and we're a lot less efficient. So the picture here shows some differences in when these cucumbers are not pollinated uh, properly, you see we get deformities in the fruit. And it, likewise, even some fruits that are open pollinated that don't necessarily need uh, pollinators, they could produce a fruit, but we see that when we don't have the pollinators present, if it's just pollinated by wind, we get this small strawberry over here. If it's self-pollinated, we kind of get this one without the the fruit part we want. And when it's pollinated by insects sufficiently, then we get the fruit that we like to uh, harvest and enjoy. So. Another thing that we don't necessarily think about is how it benefits our ecosystem. So when most people think about pollinators and plants, we automatically think about food because that's one of our direct connections, but also out in nature, plants need to be pollinated in order to reproduce. This allows these plants to reproduce and maintain our natural ecosystem. So the plants in out in nature help clean the air, they stabilize the stream bank. So you can see what happens when we don't have the plants with roots that can stabilize those by holding onto the soil. And they support wildlife, uh, including migratory birds, and uh, research has shown that birds need caterpillars to raise their young. And so we need these, the larval forms or the immature forms of these, some of these pollinators as food sources for birds and other, other animals. So, when we talk about pollinators, they're not just pollinating these plants just to do a service to them. They get a reward for it. And that what they're looking for is nectar and pollen. So flowers have developed these this reward system where the nectar is buried it's in the flower, the pollinators brush up on them, and then they are they get that pollen gets stuck on them and they move it to another flower. And that increases the genetic diversity and makes the plants more able to um, survive in different environments. So nectar is just a sugar rich sweet liquid that's made from the gl from glands called nectaries. And most flowers have their nectaries at the base of the petal. And that is so that the pollinators have to get down to the bottom of it and brush up against the structure, which is up here that has the pollen on it. These are the anthers. And so they that is how the pollen sticks to them and then they transfer it to something else in trying to get that honey or that nectar as a reward. And for those of you that like honey, nectar is the base ingredient for honey. So that's one of the rewards. Let's look at pollen. Pollen are dust-like grains that are unique to each type of plant species you see. So if you have allergies to pollen, there might be some things that you're allergic to and some things that aren't. And you can see from this electron microscope scan that uh, different pollens look quite different. The pollen develops on the anther and that is part of the male reproductive structure. Each pollen granule contains uh, the male gametes or sperm cells inside it. And like nectar, pollen is also used by pollinators as a food store source. And whereas nectar is more sugary, pollen has protein, starches, sugars, fats, and minerals. If you wonder what it, types of pollen are in this picture, I couldn't pick them out for you, but I can tell you what's in it. It has pollen from sunflowers, morning glories, ho prairie hollyhock, lilies, evening primrose, and castor beans in this picture. All right, so maybe you, uh, uh, 
have an idea that different types of pollinators are attracted to different kind, types of flowers. And this is called a pollinator syndrome. So the, that's just telling us about the characteristics or traits that may appeal to a certain type of pollinator. And then we can use those characteristics to predict what kind of pollinator would visit the flower and help the flowers reproduce. Things that we look at, like at in the pollinator syndrome are the color, the odor, the quantity of nectar, the location, the type of pollen, and the flower structure. These different combinations can affect the potential pollinator's ability to locate the flower and its food resources. Now, just because this is kind of a general thing, it doesn't mean that it's set in stone. So just because a flower says that it would attract bees may not always be the case, but this is kind of a, just a general rule. And so we'll see how this works out. We're gonna go through a couple or some different pollinators and look at what kinds of flowers they like. And we're gonna start with beetles. Yeah, when we talk about pollinators, beetles isn't usually the first thing we think of, and they're kind of messy. They are often referred to as mess and soil pollinators because they eat the flower petals and defecate in flowers. The flowers they are attracted to tend to be white or green with no nectar guides. So nectar isn't super important to beetles. Uh, they, the odor of the flower can range from nothing to foul, depending on what kind of beetle you have. Sometimes they're drawn to things that are rotting. And the beetles typically visit the flowers there for their pollen. So flowers may or may not have nectar, but there's typically going to be a lot of pollen. And that's the reward for these beetles. They are large, the flowers are large and bowl shaped usually, although we can have the smaller flowers depending on what they're looking for. And even though white and green is what you usually think of for flowers, you can see that sometimes they visit some other colors like yellow. Uh, I'm going to show you, well, I don't know, I'll give you some ideas. This is a black blister beetle on a goldenrod, and then we have a soldier beetle, a goldenrod soldier beetle, and a flower scarab here. We also have an adult locust borer, a tumbling flower beetles on a magnolia, and this is a sap beetle on goldenrod in case you are entomology uh, experts. So here's some other flowers that we might see beetles on that they would like to pollinate. Notice they kind of have a bowl shape, a large bowl shape. And you can see in our tulip tree picture that there is a lot of pollen on there. So this is our, our tulip tree. We also have an Eastern sweet shrub a yellow pond lily and a magnolia with the beetles in it. So these are type, if you're looking at these type of flowers, beetles may be their pollinator. Okay, the next one that you may not think of so much is our flies, and we're going to have two kinds of flies. We have the carrion flies, and that's just what you think it is. They are ones that usually normally visit dead animals or dung. And so they are attracted to flowers that have this pale or dark brown or purple color to resemble rotting flesh. That sounds terrible. They're shallow and funnel-like, or they may have a complex trap to keep the pollinator there a little bit longer to make ensure pollination. They have no nectar guides and they usually smell bad pollen is limited so really it's those traps that keep they think they're going to find a place to lay their eggs on some rotting flesh and they get there and they realize they're not so that's why the trapping part is important for these types this is on a pawpaw and it, a note is that people that grow pawpaws sometimes put meat out there to attract those flies to be get better pollination there's carrion flies, and then there are also flies that are flower flies. So they are going to have a different type of flower that attracts them. Usually they visit ones that are lighter in color, like yellow, cream, or, or white, and they have a more pleasant smell. At least that's what we think. It's more pleasant. They are, unlike the flowers that are pollinated by the carrion flies, 
there usually is a lot of nectar present. This is what the flies are going after. This is their reward. And it's not necessarily a lot of pollen. It is expensive for a plant. It takes a lot of energy for a plant to make pollen. So they only make enough to ensure that they can be pollinated. Some examples are bee flies and hover flies. So you'll, you can see we have bee flies and hover flies here that are, are both flower flies. Now you can see they kind of look like bees and you'll see that you get a lot of bee mimics and that's just a defensive coloring that uh, kind of tells predators to stay away. And you also will see that their pollinate the types of flowers they like to pollinate overlaps quite a bit with bees. So there's flower flies. Let's look at some things. So you see the dark kind of maroon color. This is your pawpaw, jack in the pulpits, trilliums. Those are all kinds of things that the carrion flies would like. And these smaller uh, flowers that have the flat umbel, a lot of times that's what your flower flies will like. Okay, so next we're gonna go toward moths. And usually when we're talking about moths, moths are night flying insects. And since most of the moths are nocturnal, these flowers tend to release a strong sweet smell in the evening or in at night. Flowers are usually tubular and tend to be pale, red, pink, purple, or white in color. Some white flowers kind of seem to glow at night and that's just them reflect, they open up so they can reflect the moonlight and that draws the moths in. So if you've ever seen like something advertised as a moonlight garden, that's what kind of flowers these moths are gonna like. They don't have any nectar and have limited pollen. Um, or nectar guides, I'm sorry, it's because it's at, in the evening, they can't see very well. And they have, the moths have this straw-like mouth, it's called a proboscis. So you can see it here in the clear wing moth and you can see it here in the sphinx moth, they have their proboscis extended. So it's like a very long straw that reaches down into these deep flowers and find the nectaries that are hidden at the bottom. Oftentimes moths hover as they feed, so they don't need a landing spot. And the nectar in these flowers tends to be very watery because they are, if it is such a thin tube, if it was if it had more sugar content, it might they might get plugged up. And so they need that. If you are interested, this is the clearing clear wing moth. These are primrose moths here. Such a pretty little moth. Um, these are the, not a very nice name, dingy cutworm moth. And then we have a sphinx moth here. So here are some flowers that moth, are pollinated by moths. We have an evening primrose. We have a star campion. We have a fringed prairie or white, prairie white fringed orchid. And this is actually an endangered species in Illinois and threatened in the United States. They have a slight fragrance in the daytime, but it probably becomes stronger at night. And then we have Dame's Rocket. So you notice that all these have the kind of deeper uh, middle where the nectaries are so that they can use their proboscis to get down there and get them. Okay, the one next one we have are butterflies. These tend to like flowers that are bright red and purple that have nectar guides. And I'll show you that in a second. The odor tends to be faint and fresh and they like go for nectar that is ample and deeply hidden. So they're gonna use the same kind of structure as the moth, that proboscis to get down into the deeper flowers and pull that nectar out. And they have, flowers tend to have a narrow tube with a spur or have a wide landing pad. So where moths don't necessarily land when they feed, butterflies usually do. And so you will see that as a difference. And you can see that they're much, usually more brightly colored because they're daytime flyers. So here's some pictures. We have a cardinal flower here with a black swallowtail. And we have 
prairie blazing star, a butterfly weed. This is a type of milkweed. And we have a coneflower and we have Joe pie weed. So these are some things to think about as you, if you are wanting to bring butterflies into your yard. Another thing is if you want butterflies, it's a good idea to have some food for them as they are larval, larva, like little caterpillars. Um, if you have their host plant, then you can grow your own butterflies. And so we can see that there's some things that you can grow in your garden. Uh, for example, carrots, parsley, and dill that will, you, let, you will start probably start seeing black swallowtail caterpillars on there. If you want but monarchs, you need to have milkweeds. If you want fritillaries, you need violets. If you have snapdragons, you'll find the buckeye. So you have to have the plants that they need to eat uh, as larva. If you, and usually they'll stick around, especially if you have the flowers they need as adults. So it's a good idea to have a mix of both the host plants for the caterpillars and the nectar plants for the adults if you want to get have butterflies around. All right, so now we're going to jump into bees and we're going to find out there's a lot of different kinds of bees. And that's usually when you say pollinator, people think bees. And the flowers that attract them tend to be bright, white, yellow, blue, or UV have UV nectar guides. This the nectar guides show the bees where the where the reward is. They tend to have a pleasant smell and have a shallow flower shape with a landing platform. So similar to what we saw for the butterflies. Uh, pollen is very important to bees. As a lot of a lot of bee species collect the pollen to feed their young as well as provide food for themselves. Uh, so that's what we'll see with the bees. This is a picture of some nectar guides. So you see in the foxglove here, it has some markings that show you, show the bees where the nectar is. And if we look at this flower here, this is how we would see it. This is how you see it, the bees see it in the UV. And so you see that there is a nectar, that is the nectar guide telling the bee that is where they will find the nectar reward. Now, uh, a lot of times we think, when we think bees, we think honeybees, and there are many, many more types of bees than that. Many of our native honeybee, our native bees are much more efficient than honeybees at pollinating plants. Honeybees, or the, that we're familiar with, they're very good at storing the pollen in little pouches on their legs so they can take it back to the hive. A lot of our native bees are solitary and so they don't need to do that. And so the pollen kind of just sticks to their hairy, hairy bellies and they're more efficient at getting the pollen from one flower to another because they don't need to get it back to a hive. So most, or se more than 70% of the RBs are solitary and they nest in the ground. So while we understand that honeybees are an important pollinator, they aren't native. They're actually from Europe, Asia, and Africa. So we're not gonna talk about them as we move forward in this presentation. We're gonna next talk about bumblebees. So bumblebees are typically found in temperate climates and are often at higher latitudes and altitudes than other bees. You can find them almost worldwide, except for Australia and Antarctica. There are 46 species of bumblebees north of Mexico, and in Illinois, we have 11. Bumblebees do something called buzz pollination. And well, so what they do is they can unhook their wings from their flight muscles and use those muscles to shake their entire body and they shake it at a frequency that's close to the middle C musical note. This vibration increases the release of pollen for some flowers, including tomatoes, peppers, blueberries, and cranberries. So if you, you, we look at bumblebees and we wanna attract them, they find that they get better tomato fruit set if you are attracting bumblebees to that area. So if you want more tomatoes, you want bumblebees. 
bumblebees can bask in the sun and shiver. That helps them to increase their body temperature. So you can see bumblebees flying around at much cooler daytime uh, temperatures than you would see some other bees. Bumblebees are going to be one of our few native bees that are actually have a social structure. And so their colony can have 50 to 400 individuals in it. The colonies are annual, so each, the colony will die off in the winter and new queens will overwinter and start the colonies in the spring. And they usually are gonna find cavities or like abandoned rodent bur burrows and all different things to build their nests. So um, we had a brush pile and we were moving some things and a queen bumblebee had made her nest kind of down in that area. So you, you will see them finding places where they can start to nest. They don't like it when you disturb them. They are gen generalists, so they like a wide variety of flowers. Our next type of bees, these are carpenter bees. You may have seen them, they're large. They look similar to bumblebees, but where bumblebees have a what kind of a furry abdomen, you'll see that on the carpenter bees, they have a more of a shiny black abdomen. So if you see the ones that have the shiny black um, abdomen, those are more likely to be carpenter bees. Uh, they can be considered a pest. If you have some unpainted wood on fences, homes, garages, and other structures, you might see them putting a hole in them. Uh, if you do paint the bare wood, that makes it a lot less attractive to them. And so you won't have the problem with them burrowing into things, or you can provide them places with wood that is untreated that they might find more attractive and uh, get them to go there. They are large bees. And so they like large open flowers, but they also will take these smaller flowers and they rob the nectar. So they'll, this one right here, is cutting a hole in the bottom of this to get to the nectar resource without pollinating it. So that doesn't help the plant out very much. Uh, and so they they try and make defenses against that, but obviously that is not working with these carpenter bees. They may be social containing three to five females or solitary, and they are generalists. So they will uh, visit a lot of different kinds of flowers. Now we have another type of carpenter bee. They're much, they're a lot smaller. They have weaker jaws. They're called small carpentry bees. They use, they are not going to be able to burrow into a wooden structure. So what they need is some kind of plant that has a stem with a soft pithy center. And that's where you're going to see them laying their eggs. You'll, you can see they they look a lot different than our bumblebees and the bigger carpenter bees. They're sturdy, shine, shiny, sparsely haired and have are black, blue, or green in color. And they may have yellow and white markings on their faces. These are also generalists, so they'll visit all different kinds of plant, flowers. All right, mason bees, this is the one you're gonna be making hoses for. Uh, I. We have these at my house and I just, I love them. So they're, they're small, medium-sized bees. There are some that are kind of black and bluish colored with white hairs on their thorax. The, this one right here is a red, red mason bee. And so you see that it doesn't have that kind of coloring. Both are native. They are solitary bees. So this is, there is a one female and she uh, does all the work to collect the pollen, uh, lay the eggs, build the nest, and it's all up to this one, one little lady bee here. And what they do is, so there's a nest, they make their nest in a long tube in a stem or something, and they'll put some, oh, sorry, they put some mud in it, then they make a pollen loaf and they put that together. Then they lay an egg. And so when that egg hatches, it will be able to eat that pollen loaf and then it will grow, become a cocoon, metamorphosize and come out as a, and become an adult. And that 
image that kind of adult that's not quite ready to go out is how it overwinters. And then when it's mature, it'll come out in the spring. After she does this, she makes a little mud wall. That's why she's called a mason bee. And then she will do that again with collect more pollen, lay another egg. And the interesting thing is all of the eggs in the back at the in the beginning, first she lays are female eggs. And then the last couple eggs that she lays at the end of the stem are going to become male bees. So um, there's some of the earliest bees we see. So if you want Mason, you if you have apple trees or early bloomers, this is when you would really like, like to see mason bees. They're really good at transferring pollen and they're out there when a lot of other bees can't be flying around because it's not warm enough. So those are what you think of. You need early flowering resources for mason bees. Okay. Leaf cutter bees are kind of, operate in kind of the same way, but except for they don't use mud to make their nests, they clip pieces out of leaves of plants that have not a lot of veins that are pretty thin, like roses, green ash, lilacs, Virginia creepers. I see them on my red buds. And it's not going to hurt the tree. The damage is at, small enough that it won't hurt the tree. So you don't have to try and spray them, but you'll see these kind of half circles cut out of the leaves. That's, that means you have leaf cutter bees where mason bees are really er, active earlier in the spring. Leaf cutter bees are gonna be more in the summertime. So after your mason bees have done a lot of their pollinating work and they've laid all their eggs and everything and gone through their life cycle, then you'll start seeing the leaf cutter bees. Mostly they're generalists, although some are specialists on asters and uh, in the pea family. What? They live. They live for two, two months and they are solitary nesters, just like mason bees. Okay, then we have sweat bees and they, you might see these around, they're smaller bees. They usually have a bright color metallic with markings that vary green to red to yellow. And the reason that they're called sweat bees is because you they're attracted to perspiration, which they drink for moisture and salts. Usually these will nest in the ground, maybe in some rotten wood, but for the most part, they're solitary nesters. And although you might find them build a small social group, they sometimes can sneak into the nests of other species, eat the eggs, lay their own eggs, and use their nests as their nests as they as they go forward. Okay, so let's look at some flowers that are attractive to bees. So here we have I have some different pictures of the false indigo. I have the I, you can see the pictures of the white, and we also have the blue. We have a Monarda species here. We have hyssop, and this anise hyssop. Uh, we have some smooth aster and some penstemon digitalis here. So these are all flowers that you might see bees using. Okay, so that's really a kind of an overview of some native pollinators that we would see here in Illinois. But now that we know that, and if we want to support them, what should we do? And so let's look at some pollinator garden tips. Uh, so first of all, it's important to plant your plants in clumps. So we kind of have gone over what the different types of pollinators like. It's good to plant them in clumps because it's a lot of work for them to find it. So if they find it, they want to be able to do a lot of feeding in that area instead of having to feed on just a couple flowers and then spend a lot of energy to go looking for other uh, plants to use as their food source. Now, you want to choose heavy pollen and nectar producing plants. We and this could be either an ornamental plant that is you get from the store, or it could be a native plant. So you, there's a lot of talk about native plants when we talk about pollinators, because the idea is that these plants and these native pollinators have kind of 
co-evolved. And so they have the resources that the pollinators are looking for. So, but we can't get too stuck on that definition because something is better than nothing. So if you, it's, you're unable to get a native plant, there are lots of other kinds of plants that can provide the resources they need. So really what we need to look at is, does this plant support the ecology that I want in my yard? So what, what you don't, the more modified the flower is, the less likely it is to support the, the, the pollinator that it co-evolved with. So if you have a flower that's usually got a single row of petals, and now you get the one that has a double row of petals, that means that some of those resources have been changed from uh, pollen producing or, or nectar resources into petals. And so it may not be attra as attractive or supportive for the pollinators. So the more modified it is away from the original, usually, um, the less attractive it is to the pollinators. Not to say that it's not helpful, it's just the closer you stay to the original, usually the better uh, it supports the pollinators. Also, because we have pollinators that are coming out early in the spring and we have them all the way till the late in the fall, we wanna make sure that we have blooms that entire time to support them. And you really, it what they suggest is that you have three different types of flowers per season so that they have a balanced uh, plate is what they kind of relate it to. Yeah, so here's a diagram that kind of shows you uh, different flowers and when they are going to be blooming. So we see like in the early spring, we're going to have Virginia bluebells and some uh, wild columbine, that might be what you have in the spring. And then as we move to the summer, we're going to get a lot more things blooming. And then as we move to the fall, you can see there's different types of things. So I'll show you a resource. I, this, I know it's going to be hard for you to absorb all this information in this short time, but there are some resources that you can look at that show you different bloom times. Okay, so let's talk about native plants. People tend to think that native plants are far superior to non-natives in supporting pollinators and wildlife. And that is, it can be true, but it isn't. There's other, there's other plants that can also provide benefits. So when it comes to native plants, first you have to decide what native means. Some people, as long as it is in North America, they say it's native. Other people say, well, if it's from Illinois, it's native. And other, yet others say, um, is it from my county? Is it from my little specific region? So you really have to decide what, how it, how native or how far are you going to open your circle um, and consider it native? The other thing, just because it's native does not mean it's a great garden plant. Some natives can be aggressive and that's how they've survived all this. So that needs to be taken into consideration, especially if you have a small garden. Goldenrod is one of those keystone species that supports a lot of pollinators, but if you get um, some types are really aggressive and they will take over your whole garden and then you don't have all the variety of resources you need. There are some goldenrods that are stay put pretty good and they don't take over. So you have to pick the one that's right for your area or what you need to do. Other things, um, sometimes if you look at this picture, poison ivy. Poison ivy is a native, but that just doesn't that doesn't mean that you want it growing in your in your garden just because it's a native. So you have to think these things through. What, what job do you want your flowers to do? And are there some things that are less desirable that would take that native plant out of your garden? Uh, sometimes native plants have diseases. And also we have to think about this. So native plants from Illinois were growing on a certain soil. But a lot of times when homes are built on that, uh, they dig down to the subsoil. And so we see that it's not the same. They've lost their mycorrhizal relationships with the fungus that helps them absorb water. And we also have climate change. So just because it grew here before 
doesn't mean that this is the, it's going to be really low maintenance here. You may have to do a lot, quite a bit of work to get it established. Not to say that there's not great things about native plants, but it's something to think about as you are choosing things. So I want to show you some different things. If you just, uh, we can also think about trees and shrubs. They are important floral resources. And especially for like mason bees, they are early blooming and so they are a good resource and they can just produce a lot of flowers at one time. And if that's when you have the pollinators there, they can be a great resource. And so uh, just some maples and so you'll see the flowers on them really early. They, are, they have a lot of pollen. Uh, nine bark is this picture here. I don't know if you've seen nine bark. It's a really beautiful plant and it has pretty uh, exfoliating bark in the winter. The willows grow really fast and make a lot of pollen early in the season. Red buds, so this is a red bud, and then a button bush. This one is a button bush. So there's a lot of different shrubs that make a lot of floral resources at different times of the year. And then we might also look at some more ornamental uh, annual plants. Annual plants can be good because they produce flowers for a really long season. So if they have the resources the pollinators need, the pollen and the nectar, then they can be a great addition to a garden to support them. So here's some that I, I we noticed that pollinators like salvia, zinnia, rudbeckia, sunflowers, marigolds, cosmos, snapdragons, and hyssop. So if we look at this picture, this is a allium called purple sensation. And I have some similar to this and there are pollinators all over them uh, for quite a long time during the summer. We have autumn joy sedum. So this would be one that's blooming in the autumn when maybe some of your other floral resources are starting to dwindle. We have zinnias, butterflies love zinnias. I see butterflies on them all the time. Cosmos, this is a marigold. It's called Bambino. Notice that this isn't like a double marigold. A lot of times when you see marigolds, they have lots and lots of petals. This one would be a better one for pollinators because you can see it has the um, middle part with the anthers and the, the pollen and the nectar. And then we have here a salvia and I see pollinators on these all the time. Even your some flowers that you see in your lawn that you might think are weeds, they can be good floral resources for pollinators, especially dandelions or first thing in the spring, and then your clover throughout the season. All right. It's good to have the food they need, but if you want pollinators to thrive, you need to provide them some other resources, such as a place for nesting and egg laying. So shrubs, tall grasses, low growing plants that can provide them habitat and areas for overwintering. One thing you can think about doing is leaving flower stalks and dead plant material in your garden. That is only if you haven't had a disease problem. And then your bees can nest in those. Leave some pair, patches of bare ground because sometimes if everything is mulched over or has plants growing on it, there's no place for ground nesting bees to make their nest. And then leave some dead tree trunks on your landscape and wood nesting bees and beetles will use them. All right, so uh, one of the things that it sounds like you're going to do is make a bee nest box. So there's some things to think about that as you make them. Uh, one thing is you have to have, you wanna have the hole deep enough. It needs to be like seven inches long. Uh, a lot of times you see them when they're too shallow. If you do, if you don't have them deep enough, then the, the proportion of, bees that are males to females is thrown off and you won't get enough females to uh, do the work in that solitary nesting. So uh, you have to make sure that you have the right size tubes and different bees will use different sizes of the hole. So uh, you, you can do a, a bunch of different ones. You don't wanna use like the bamboo that is not the best because it 
it doesn't work with the the mason bees very well. So you want to use the natural reeds or paper tubes and you replace them every year. So if you get a block and you just drill holes in it, you can only use that one year because you start to get pathogens and parasitoids that lay their eggs in there. This one, it has holes in it, but you see how they have been cut in half. So you can take them out. You can open it up and clean them out. You should put a tube in there uh, and remove those every year. It's also better if you do several smaller bee houses than a, lot, lot, a big one, because when you have a big one, everything all together, it says, uh, here I am, I'm prey, please come eat me. And it also pathogens spread throughout. You should place your bee hotels so that they're, they get warm in the, in the morning so that the bees can warm up and go do the work that they need to do. And you also shouldn't put them too close to the ground so that animals like uh, can get in there and disrupt the nest. So those are some things to think about as you're making them. Also, bees are highly visual. They, they sense different things. So you, want, you don't necessarily want them all flat. You make them in a 3D arrangement and you can even give some markings on some of them so that the it's like telling the bee an address so that it can find its specific nest. So you want to help support them in that way. You also want to make sure that you have a water source for them. So some shallow water dish with rocks in it or something for them to sit on so that they don't drown when they're trying to get a drink. Water is important. So a place to live, food to eat, and water to drink are some important things if you want to have pollinators uh, on your, in your space. So some other things we can do is give them some protection from wind and rain, just like we don't like to get soaked and blown all over the place, neither do our pollinators. So give them a little bit of shelter. And then we need to rethink how much damage and what aesthetic we are gonna tolerate because an untidy garden can give them some more habitat. You want to allow for some plant damage. As we mentioned before, uh, beetles might eat some of your petals, leaf cutter bees can cut up the leaves, caterpillars will eat foliage, and if you get rid of them, then you won't have the butterflies and moths that we need for pollinators. One thing you can do is reduce or eliminate the use of pesticides, especially insecticides, and if you do need to use them, make sure you follow label instructions and do it carefully. They are, they usually have some instructions specifically to protect pollinators. So you wanna make sure that you're paying attention to all those. It's better to first use uh, different pest management techniques like picking them off with your hand, disease resistant cultivars and other types of uh, more cultural controls. So, and then uh, let's see. If you do use pesticides, make sure you don't have them when the pollinators will be active and on the flowers. It's also a good idea to keep a journal. Then you can keep track of what kind of pollinators are visiting your garden, what plants they prefer, which ones are getting visited the most and where they're staying, and do you need to change some of the flowers? Do you have flowers blooming throughout the season? All those kinds of things are helpful. What is the weather like? What do you notice? And so those are great things that you can do to help you inform your decisions as you go on in your journey to support pollinators. Oh, if you wanna know, this is a hornworm that will become a sphinx moth. So you might not like to see them eat your tomatoes, but these are the this is the pollinator it will become. All right, here are some different resources if you're looking for some places to get more information on pollinators. And I did, did wanna highlight this one. This is our Illinois pollinator one that we have been working on for several years and it's just become live. So in April, it will be fully launched, but it has a lot of great information. You can do, so it tells you all about pollinators in Illinois. It, it helps you pick plants for what, uh, with a selection tool, and it gives you some pre-designed pollinator habitats that you could plant at your, on your property.
Okay, th my name is Nicole Flowers Kimberly, and here is my contact information. Feel free to send me uh, questions if you have them, and I would love to chat with you about that. All right. Do we have questions or? Thank you, Nicole. That was so informative. I learned a lot. <laughs> um, that, that's really cool. Um, if you guys do have any questions, feel free to put them in the question and answer box or in the chat and I can ask her. I do have a question for you, Nicole, though. Okay. Um, what would you say is your favorite pollinator from the ones that you mentioned today? Um, okay. So I love butterflies. Butterflies are kind of my thing. And we have put in a butterfly garden at my kids' school and one at our house. So I love those. But I think as as the most effective pollinators, it's probably some of those solitary bees. So we did order some mason bees and got them shipped to us and they came out and they were so fascinating to watch them come out and try and find their, they're just a lot of fun to uh, have around. So I think those two are my favorite. Although one of my colleagues, uh, he has taught his kids to have the bumblebees land in his hand, their hands and, and pet them. So uh, that, <laughs> that is, is one so thing. cool. One thing that I didn't really mention, when the bees don't have hives and they're not solitary, they're a lot less aggressive. So sometimes people are worried about that with bees, that if you have flowers, then you might have more stinging. Um, we have them at our, we have bees all over and insects all over in my butterfly garden. My kids are out there all the time and we haven't been stung, but we're also very careful that we give them space and we watch them carefully. So um, but the native bees, usually solitary bees, are not very aggressive. And so that's a good thing to know. Wow, that's, that's really cool. Um, so it does say that our chat is disabled. I'm not sure why, but um, it looks like our question and answer is working. So uh, we do have a question. It says, what sort of markings should I put on my mason bee habitat? Would it work to paint flowers on it? Um, and she said, sorry, I'm very new to this. Oh, so you can paint on your box. Bees really do notice it. So like when you're talking about honeybees, they m put markings on their hives and the bees know which hive is there. So you can do markings on your box. But what I'm talking about is like the tubes that are facing, you don't want them all like flat flush you want to have like some sticking out and some pushed in and then you can just take like a safe marker and mark different colors because they can tell that especially like black and blue and that kind of thing white they should be able to and you don't have to do it to all of them just some of them so they have a reference and they go okay my tube is the one that is this far from that marking and they can they can tell that and remember that you're so smart. That is so cool. <laughs> um, all right, so we have another question. So this is from LP. What is one flower I can plant in Lake Zurich that is easy to easy to plant? So I guess a, a, a beginner friendly plant that would help our pollinators. I okay for me, Cosmos. You can just put the seed out there and they will grow. Zinnias are the same way, except they are warm season, so you couldn't put them out now. It's too cold, but it may be like in the end of like in May, you can put those out. I have them, I just put seeds out behind my shed and they grew and I've had them for a couple of years and now they reseed themselves and they just keep coming back. And I know they're not native, um, but they do support a lot of pollinators. Now, if you wanna go for native plants, I have some, Black eyed Susan that um, they like. I have uh, a cone flower that they like. And then the Leatris is that pretty kind of purple spike. And it is just a bulb. And I saw that you can get 80 of them at Costco for like $15. And we just put them in all around our butterfly garden. They're so pretty. And butterflies and bees just love them. So um, I hear that you have to kind of you might have to replant them they don't last long long times but they will last a couple years so that's something to think about does that answer the question or would you like more because there's oh i have so many if i gotta find my i want to show you this is called 
Oh, you can't see it with my blurry background. A <laughs> full sun pollinator garden. It's by the Illinois Indiana Sea Grant. Um, mm -hmm. Yolanda, I can send this to you in a thing. So if you want to have it at the library, but yes. this is really nice. I know you're not going to be able to see this, but I'm going to tell you anyway. It has um, pictures of what it looks like in all four seasons. So it tells you all these different plants and it shows you pictures of what they will look like in the spring, in the summer, in the fall. It also tells you what pollinators it, it, it supports and what conditions that you need. And the nice thing about this one is it has some designs already drawn up on the back. Oh, good. Okay. So I will send that to you. And then there's another one called the Illinois Native Plants. And this is a really nice one from the same place. It has more plants, but less kind of design things. So I'll send those to you and you can hand them out. Yeah, your life. that'd be great. Yeah, I will um, definitely send them over and I'll print some out. And if okay. anybody's interested, please stop by the forge. We'll have them out. Um, I'll print them out as soon as I am able to. Okay. So we have just a couple more questions and then let's do these last three and then we'll be done. So, um, Kat wants to know, are there some shade plant options that you recommend? Oh, yeah, so there are a lot of shade plants. I will send you one with shade plants too. So that gets more into like more of a woodland type thing, but just as important. And so some of these plants can tolerate a little bit of shade, but really, you know, a lot of our, our native plants are prairie plants, but... Uh, and so that's kind of what we think of, but there are important native plants like blue bells, violets, which some people don't want in their yards, but I think they're lovely and they support a, a butterfly that is not in declining population called fritillaries. And so um, they, you might consider leaving them. Um, let's see what else. I've, I've planted a bunch of shady type plants, but I can't can't think of them right off the top of my head. I will find the shade one and send that to you too. I'm sorry, I can't think of them right now. No, that's fine. Um, so I'm not sure if she answered this one, um, but it says, what if you have a very shaded property? Is there a good plant for that? So I'm assuming they want to know if, if they have a shady property, is there right. plants that could so, probably help, I guess? Okay, so there <laughs> are some, there are plants that do fine in the shade. It also could be a place where you do shrubs and also just having plants kind of growing that are maybe some native ferns or stuff that provides habitat. So even if you can't provide the floral resources, you can provide resources in other ways. Um, a lot, and there's, there are like a goldenrod that does good and does well in the shade. There's some asters that do well in the shade. And so you just have to find that kind of spot where you have plants that do. I, I have a bell, flat, one called a bell flower and I have it in the shade and it does pretty well. Um, so there's different, there's just different ones that you can use. And I will get you that, um, brochure with the shady ones too so that you can get some native shade plants awesome thank you and then we do have some comments um someone mentioned that cardinal flowers like shade uh joy joe pie weed attracts many different butterflies and bees oh yeah joe pie weed is yeah good. and, and then, you can get it in the if you get the native uh open pollinated kind it gets really tall but you can get some shorter ones as long as the flowers look really similar usually and for the most part, they are good pollinator resources, so. Nice. And then it cardinal, looks like so many... Oh, I was going to say continue. cardinal flower is an interesting one because if if you don't disturb the soil after a while, you might see your cardinal flower decline. So just kind of scratch up that soil a little bit because it needs a little bit of disturbance to be happy. And you might you might see regenerative growth there. Oh, cool. Um. Can you repeat the flower that you bought at Costco? Someone's wanting to write that It's down. called Leatris. Leatris. Oh, yeah. And it also might be called like Blazing Star or Prairie Blazing Star. Cool. So um, we have a lot of people who know about their flowers. Some more shade flowers recommended are Bellwort, Virginia Bluebells, Wild Geranium, and Columbine. Uh, yeah. Those awesome. Are you guys definitely know more about flowers than I did. I learned a lot today. That's for sure. Oh, um, I glad. just recently learned that there was different kinds of bees. 
And I'm just right now fascinated about mason bees. I think it's like amazing what they do. So um, yeah, I just, again, want to say thank you for um, teaching us about all this awesome stuff. I really appreciate you taking the time to show us all this information. All right, so we're going to close out. Thank you again for joining us, Nicole. And I hope to see you guys in the forge um, later this week.